basically break up fractions on their numerators. But you have to do it very, very carefully. And it's definitely not easy. So let's do a really quick review of, we're gonna be doing these on polynomials, so this is a really, really fast review of polynomial division. So if you divide polynomials, if they divide perfectly, you're left with some new polynomial, meaning if the remainder was zero. What happens if the remainder is not zero? You get plus remainder over your original quotient. So this r of x would be the remainder. Now, <clears throat> what we're going to do, if you get a higher degree polynomial on the top than the bottom, you can, or to the same degree, you can actually divide, and you'll get some polynomial here, and then we're going to break down just the remainder. So, because of this fact, we're going to assume that your degree on the top is less than degree on the bottom. So your numerator degree will be the higher degree. So, summarizing that, if degree P is greater than or equal to degree Q, then divide and only consider it and, and you f of x will be a polynomial you could easily integrate that so you'll just focus on the remainder the r of x over q of x so this is actually called uh, so you're going to then divide and then do partial fraction decomposition. So in biology, decomposition is easy. It happens automatically. Mathematics is not easy. You got to do it by hand. So decomposition is what we're going to be doing. The first step is you factor Q of X into irreducible factors over the real numbers. So we're going to factor factor Q of X over the real numbers. So why am I saying the real numbers? What could I factor a polynomial over? Yeah, all the complex numbers. So if we see a factor uh, something like x squared plus 1, x squared plus 1 does not factor over the real numbers. It would factor over uh, plus or minus i. So we're going to factor as far as we can over the real numbers. Now that's a precalculus 1 move right there to factor over the real numbers. So we're going to get q of x equals, there's going to be a bunch of factors, so it could be uh, we'll go Q1 of X, Q2 of X. And it also could be raised to a power. So we'll call this power A1. Then there could be another factor, Q2 of X to the A2 power. Multiply, multiply, multiply. Qn of X raised to the An power. So we will not look at q of x's that have more than three factors. So we're not going to have like 25 factors. That would be insane. So I think we'll probably cap it at like three factors. And we are going to look at how, what these factors mean for uh, the way your partial fractions is going to work. Let's start with uh, 
So we'll decompose this first. So when you have uh, no matter what degree your q of x is, so for each qi of x, you get another term. We'll go P1, PI of X over QI of X, where PI of X is a is a generic polynomial of one degree below below. I of X. So for each power of QI of X, so for each power, what I'm talking about is the AI right here. So if AI is more than one, you're going to get uh, one term for each, uh, basically for each number. So for each power you get an additional term. So we're going to go through these uh, by doing examples. So there's some more verbose uh, instructions in your textbook, but we're just going to go through with some examples here. So we're going to decompose. This is already factored in the, in the numerator, so I don't need to worry about factoring. What if I wasn't sure x squared plus 1 was irreducible? How could I check if x squared plus 1 is irreducible? I could try to factor. So there's a really big theorem in pre-calculus one class that every factor corresponded to a, or every real zero corresponded to a factor. In fact, every complex zero corresponded to a factor, they just didn't show up as x-intercepts. But every complex zero also showed up as a factor. So what we're going to do is set it equal to zero and see if we can solve. So we're going to use that correspondence theorem, factors correspond to zeros. So we're going to look for zeros. So try to factor by looking for the zeros. All right, easy to solve this. What's the first step? Zero equals x squared plus one. Subtract one. Subtract one on both sides. Negative one equals x squared. X equals plus or minus square root negative one, which is plus or minus i. All right, is that a real solution? Nope. So I could write down the factors. What are the factors? X minus I, the other factor is X plus I. If I multiplied it out, what do we call these two products? Special name. Difference of squares, also known as conjugates. So I'm gonna multiply these super quickly x squared minus i squared. And what's i squared? Negative 1. So minus i squared, this is x squared minus minus 1. x squared plus 1. So x squared plus 1 is a conjugate. It's not obvious conjugate. 
It does factor, it just doesn't factor over the real numbers. So this is what we call irreducible over the real numbers. It can take a long time to factor certain polynomials. So I will give you pre-factored polynomials on your uh, quiz slash midterm slash final whenever partial fraction shows up. So you won't have to actually factor them. So you won't have to go back through the pre-calculus one steps of rational zero theorem, trying out those zeros, divided by those factors that you got from the zero, and then repeating the process a couple times. So I won't make you do that again in this class. That takes a long time. What we will be doing is this process of for each uh, factor in the denominator, we have to do something. So that's something we need to do is write it with the generic polynomial of one degree lower. So I'm going to rewrite this now. Well, let's zoom out, that's better. So my first denominator, x squared plus one, that's my first irreducible factor. All right, easy question. What is one degree less than the degree of x squared plus one? The degree will be one. All right, so I need a generic degree one polynomial, also known as a linear function. So a lin uh, linear function or degree one polynomial is ax plus b. Now I say generic because I don't know how many x's and I don't know how much constant. I'm going to figure out A and B. I don't know right now. So again, AX plus B, this is a generic degree one polynomial. So I got degree two on the bottom, so I'm gonna have degree one on the top. So that's the important thing to pay attention to. Next up, so I'm done with X squared plus one. Now I have X minus one squared. So for each power, for the first power, I just have x minus one. Now, x minus one, what is the degree? One. Degree that's one, so I need a degree zero in the numerator. What is a degree zero polynomial? One. Just a number. So there's no x's, just a constant number. So I'm going to use, I'm just going picking a, b, c, the other words are going to be d, e, f if I need them. So I'm just going to picking out letters starting at A. All right, so we had degree one on the bottom. We get degree zero on the top. That doesn't mean the number zero. It means degree zero. So it's going to be constant. Now, I have to deal with the fact that that was squared right there. So I get one term for each power. So I got one term for the first power, and now one term for the second power. <laughs> And this is a degree one irreducible, so I get degree zero in the top. Normally I say stay away from D's, but we're using capital letters, so we generally don't use capital D for derivative, so I'm gonna use D's now. And capital E's and F's if I need them. So it should look a little arbitrary right here you will probably believe that if you add these together, your denominator will be the right denominator. Do you at least ag agree with that part from your adding fraction experience? Your decade of adding fractions together? Common denominator definitely gives you the denominator on the left side. Right? There's not very much in common. I'm going to have an x minus 1 squared, so I don't need to really, I don't, this doesn't contribute anything, this middle term, to the denominator. And then this first term contributes to x squared plus 1. So here's my common denominator on the left side. That is why uh, you can break it up like this. The tricky part, what in the heck goes on top? That's the tricky part. How do we get the top to work out? So now we're going to spend time figuring out a, b, c, and d. So what is my attitude on fractions? They suck. 
So how do we take this equation and not have fractions? I can't just erase the denominators. So if I, if I did reciprocal, I could reciprocate the left side, but the right side, if I reciprocate it, it would be one, it would look like this, one over all that stuff. So that, that would be pretty bad. All right, what algebra can I do to get rid of denominators? Can't just erase them. Multiply by the common denominator, which is already on the left side. So we're going to multiply by everything that's on the left side to get us out of fraction land. So fractions suck. You should not forget that, hopefully, if I taught you one thing. So there is what I need to multiply by. So distribute it to you know, every single term here. The left side is super easy, it just cancels. So left side we have that negative sign sh is attached to the 2x, not attached to the whole, um, not the entire fraction is not negative, it's just the negative 2x. Now the right side you gotta be more careful some stuff cancels, some stuff doesn't. So algebra questions at this point. So the only thing that I've done that should that you should be skeptical about is how did I know that the numerators were going to look just like this? Everything else I did is just sort of algebra two type stuff right here. Everything else is just algebra. Now the question is how do I figure out A, B, C, and D? So I could match coefficients, that's the hard part, or not the hard part, that is the sort of long way that always works. There's another thing I can do which is pick x values that make this nice. What is an obvious x value that makes a lot of these terms disappear? One's pretty good. Why is one good? It'll make x minus one disappear. So I'm going to pick as many x values as I can that make this a lot more simple. So we're going to pick x values. Sometimes there's only one x value, sometimes there's no x values. But we're going to pick x values to find as many constants as possible. I'm going to start with x equals 1. Now when you go x equals 1, every place I see an x turns into 1. You can't just turn half the x's into 1's and half the x's leave them alone. So when you go x equals 1, you got to uh, swap out every x for the number 1. Or else you're not treating them the same. So we got minus 2 plus 4 equals... I see that this is x minus 1 here, so I'm just going to write zero for that term. It's zero times a plus b, but I don't care, still times zero. Plus c times zero plus zero plus one squared plus one is two plus two d. Negative two plus four is two equals two d. d equals one. There we go. d equals one. We got one of the four constants figured out. So we're going to rewrite everything except I'm going to replace d with the number 1. Two 
to make this look nicer, I'm going to subtract x squared plus 1 to the other side. So we're only going to have uh, constant a, b's, and c's on the right side. So I want to get things that don't have a, b, and c to the back to the left side. And so I want this x squared plus 1. There's no d anymore. I got rid of d and put in a number. So I'm going to move that to the left side. So we have a minus x squared minus 2x plus 3 equals ax plus b times x minus 1. Uh-oh, something is wrong. Did I lose a square somewhere? Or did I? Yeah. All right. I have some math spidey sense right there. Should be squared. Yes. All right. You can pick an x value that makes something here zero. Just to warn you, if I rechoose one, what am I going to get? Zero. 0 on the right, and I'll get minus 1, minus 2, plus 3, 0 equals 0. True, but not very helpful finding out a, b, and c. So you don't want to reuse x values. You're not going to get any more information out. There is an x value that will work here. You have to think outside the box. Not that far outside, because I already worked this algebra out earlier. What's another x value that will work? I work. What will I do? I makes x squared plus one zero. So you could use x equals i. You do not have to keep it real. You can go imaginary. You could also use negative i. That would also turn this into zero. Uh, just to warn you, that won't eliminate a right here. You'll have a i plus b times whatever in the heck this thing foils into. So if you go that route, you have some complex uh, algebra to do. I just want to warn you. And I'm not going to go that route uh, for a few reasons. One of them is I don't want to get into complex numbers right now. And I want to go with the linear algebra method instead. So I just want to tell you, you can go with uh, complex values, and it will work. But that's not the way your book does it. It's not the way I'm going to do it. You probably won't see that done very much on YouTube either. So you can do it on your own for fun, but I'm not going to show you how to do it. It's not hard to do, it just takes a little time. Uh, the way I'm going to show you is also not hard to do, and it also takes a little time. So it's just the way that people do it. So we're going to go the other way. It's called match coefficients. I don't know why I spelled that with a B. Match coefficients. I'm going to expand the entire right side. So I need to foil, I'm going to foil x minus 1 squared first. That is x squared minus 2x plus 1. And we'll multiply x minus 1 times x squared plus 2. We have x cubed minus x squared plus x minus 1. And now multiplying everything together, we have ax cubed, ax cubed plus bx squared minus 2ax squared minus 2ax squared plus ax minus 2b. I should get one more term, which is plus b plus cx squared minus c, oops, cx cubed minus cx squared plus cx minus c, and all this stuff equals, and I'm going to 
ensure that our powers match. So I'm going to put a 0x cubed minus, two, no, minus x squared minus 1x squared minus 2x plus 3. And now I'm going to organize into decreasing powers of x. Algebra questions? Oh, that will be important. AX cubed minus 2AX squared plus BX squared minus 2BX. So that's that minus 2BX? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Is that squared or cubed? Cubed. That's a CX cubed. The last four terms should be a little easier to see where they, they just get a C from everything above the last four terms there. All right, we're going to load up the, let's see, we're going to factor by counting uh, decreasing powers of x. So x cubed, I have a plus c, x cubed, x squared terms, I see 3x squared terms total. I have b minus 2a minus c x squared. And for x's, I see a minus 2b plus c constants. I should only have two, B minus C. So now we're gonna match coefficients. So I need the same number of X cubes on both sides. If they're going to be equal, right? I can't have 15 x cubes on one side and 14 on the other side. I need the same amount on both sides. How many x cubes are on the left side? None, so zero. How many x cubes are on the right side? A plus C. So zero equals A plus C. And I'm going to write it in the other order so that So I'm going to write it as a plus c equals 0. And what about x squared terms? We have minus 1x squared, and that is b minus 2a minus c. Oh, I want to write it in the right order. Minus 2a plus b minus c. Now, x's, I have negative 2. And I also have a minus 2b plus c. And last up, b minus c matches up with 3. So if you're in linear algebra, you're very happy at this moment. You're like, don't worry, I got it. If you're not in linear algebra, pay very close attention. I'm going to only use this matrix uh, method one time. I have all the stuff I linked to for the linear algebra stuff. All is valid for uh, the system of linear equations, which is exactly what we have. So our system is overdetermined. We have four equations. We could have done it in three. Uh, so when we do some reduction, we should see, you should always come out with one solution. You should not have free variables, and you should not have inconsistent or no solution. So this should always work out to be one solution, which means if you're a super linear algebra nerd, you can go with Kramer's rule if you have a square matrix. Uh, 
If you don't know Cranberry's rule, don't even worry about it. We're not going to cover determinants or any of that good stuff. So we're going to have 1, 0, 1, 0 as our first row. So it goes 1A, 0Bs, 1C, and then 0 is what I augment it with. And then second row is minus 2, 1, minus 1, minus 1. Third row, 1, minus 2, 1, minus 2. And last row, 0, 1, minus 1, 3. So there's our linear system on the left, our augmented matrix on the right side. So this is also known as a coefficient matrix. And I'm going to do row reduction. And the idea where we want to go with this is to have a matrix that has It'll look like this. One's in the diagonal, and then some numbers. And our matrix has an extra row, so that last row should be all zeros. Right there, so I won't bother writing it. If we don't get all zeros, uh, it could be inconsistent. All right, row reduction. If you've done row reduction, if you're in linear algebra, go ahead and do it. If you're not linear algebra, you can pay attention to what I say. Or you can still pay attention to what I say. It's up to you. But I'm just going to do row reduction. So you can totally do it on your own if you're comfortable with row reduction. So I'm going to use the 1 here. I'm going to knock out the negative 2 and the 1. So I'm going to go with plus 2 row 1 and a minus row 1. I normally write these on the right side, but I ran out of room. So I'm going to go take this 1 and I'm going to knock out the negative 2 and knock out the positive 1. So 1 times 2 is 2, minus 1 is 1. So negative 1 plus 1 is 0, minus 2. Now we've cleared out column one. We're going to go for column two now. So the one I circled, we're going to use to knock out every uh, entry in column two. So I need to go down to co column th or row three and four. So I have plus no. Uh -oh. So plus 2 row 2, and the last one is minus row 2. So all I'm doing in these row operations is multiplying row 2 by that number, and then adding that to the row that I wrote this on. So for right here, in row 3, I'm going to add 2 times everything in row 2 to all the entries in row 3, so that I get 2 minus 2 is 0. So I'm trying to eliminate that minus 2. That should be what? It should be negative 4. The 0 should be negative 4. Right? Yeah. Yeah. That should be a negative 4? Yeah. Good, because this is going to be inconsistent. Yeah. And I told you, you're never going to get inconsistent. 
So if you get inconsistent, something went wrong. In this case, I flipped a negative sign or whatever led to that mistake. Unfortunately, your linear algebra class, there's lots of outcomes. You're not guaranteed a single solution. So you don't have to worry about free variables or all that scary stuff now. All right. So we'll go plus. So we're good in column two. We're in the column, last column here, column three. Let's, so I'll just knock out, you know, let's multiply by half in row three. You could multiply by negative a half in row four, although we're gonna eliminate it no matter what. So we're in just column three now. And it looks like all of them are minus row three. So I need to use that one in row three and then knock out every other one. So it's just minus every single other one. Other one. So we have two, zero, one, zero, negative two, so it's positive two minus one is one, zero, zero, one, negative two, zero, 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 zero. All right, this corresponds to one A equals two, one B equals one, one C equals negative two. Of course, you don't need to write the one next to the A, B, and the C. I'm just literally writing the equation that would correspond to each row here. I don't need, you could write the last equation, zero equals zero, but that's not very useful. So we don't necessarily need to write that last equation down. All right, so we know A, we know B, we know C. At some point we knew D. So let's go way back to the top, two, one, negative two. I probably won't, oh, look at this, I do have room. So I'm going to rewrite what we started with here. I'm going to rewrite it with numbers in A, B, C, and D. So it's two, Two one or A and B. A is two B is one. Okay. C was negative two. All right. Uh, D was one. You can easily check this even if you're only an Algebra 2 student. How do you check if this is actually equal? If you're sane, you go and check to make sure that if I add them together, that I actually get this fraction over here. If the other options, you can redo everything you just did and see if you get the same thing. Uh, but I strongly recommend don't redo what you just did. It's going to take a long time, and chances are if you made some mistake the first time, you probably make it a second time. So you could add these together, common denominator, et cetera, et cetera. So let's check. You probably won't have time to check on quiz or a midterm, but we have a little extra time right now. So 2x plus 1 times my missing denominator is x minus 1 squared minus two times a single x minus one and then x squared plus one and last up plus one times x squared plus one. Well, that wasn't on D, <laughs> that was in the last row the equation that corresponded was the equation zero equals zero. So 
D was never inside of our matrix, even at the very beginning, because our matrix was based off these equations right here. So D never showed up. I could have matched coefficients, where are we, way up here? No. I could have done match coefficients on my first step, but I would have had uh, x to the fourth power term, and my matrix would have just had one more column in it. It would have had an A, B, C, D column. Same number of rows. Is that right? No, there would be one extra row. Uh, but, I would, but I would get the same numbers for A, B, C, and D. This just shortened up my linear algebra a tiny bit with some, in my opinion, slightly faster algebra. So we are trying to multiply all this stuff together. Does it actually work? Is there a smart way to do this? I don't know if there's a smart way to do this. Oh, I completely forgot about the denominator, but let's just not let's just not worry about that. Um, technically I'd have to put in every number and check for every number, which is not humanly, it's not possible for anybody. Um, so what you do is check with algebra instead. So there's some fractions, there's a denominator over there. I'm not worried about it though. All right, I'm not going to multiply these out. I don't think we're going to learn anything if I multiply them out. Plus, if I'm wrong, that's not fun. <laughs> All right, so here's a good time for Wolfram. Just to warn you, Wolfram will do partial fractions for you, but I strongly recommend you don't use that initially. Only if you check it and you're like, ah, it's wrong, then you may want to go back and see, oh, okay, I see that I messed up on the B. So then I'll go recheck my linear, but at least my D was right, and then the B was wrong, so I'll just redo that linear algebra step, uh, that linear algebra reduction that I did. So if you haven't done much row reduction, there's lots of chances for errors. You flip one negative sign, one place, and nobody's happy, it doesn't work out. So when it comes to grading, I follow your steps like a story, and then when you lead me down the wrong path, maybe you just made like one arithmetic error like I did. Uh, well, the one I did left uh, the system inconsistent, so you better catch that. If you get an inconsistent system, no solution, you better go back and figure out what happened, but if you get just the wrong number, like it actually worked out, uh, I usually would take off one or two points if it was some type of numerical computation error up there. And we'll only get inconsistent if we're Every partial fractions will work out if done correctly. So the two places you could go wrong, you could go wrong somewhere down here in the algebra, right here, whether it's matching coefficient, like actually the sort of algebra two part, could have an error or we learn algebra. If that's all perfect, the other option is it may not decompose like this. So if I had uh, this, I would not be able to decompose it like that. Does that make sense? So your algebra could be correct, but if your forms are not correct, you it won't, it won't be able to squeeze it into a different form. Uh, now, just to warn you, if you go too far on a really common dx plus e, a very common mistake is looking, oh, x minus 1 squared, that's degree 2. You want to look at the irreducible degree as 1. But if you accidentally put too high of a degree, it's okay. What you will find out is in this case, d would equal 0 and your e would equal 1. So if you go too high of a degree, it'll work out because your whatever was too much x, you'll just get zero. So if you go if you put a generic polynomial one degree too high, it's actually it'll work out just fine. It won't mess you up. Your algebra would be a tiny bit longer, but you'll, you're you're going to get that d would be zero, and then e would be the one right there. So I just wanted to warn you if you go if you are unsure, put one degree higher 
if you think, should this be degree three or degree four, go degree four. Like go to the higher degree. Don't go to the lower degree if you're not sure. Your algebra will be a tiny bit longer, but you'll still get the right answer if you stick with it. So that's partial fractions. Why are we doing all this? Which I didn't do any calculus at all here. If we wanted, where are we? If we wanted to integrate this example right here. So let's go ahead and integrate. So we did all this algebra work in order to integrate. got integral 2x plus 1 over x squared plus 1 minus 2 over x minus 1 plus 1 over x minus 1 squared dx. So the question is, can you do these antiderivatives in this second form right here? We just did the algebra to show that they're equal. Well, we didn't check, but it's in my notes, so it's probably equal. How do we, let's do the middle term first. What's the antiderivative of two over x minus one? How would you get that? So we'll go integral on two x plus one minus two integral one over x minus one dx plus integral one over x minus one squared dx. All right, how do I knock out the second integral? Antiderivative one over x minus one. Sounds a lot like a natural log. That's a little u sub natural log. It'll be natural log of x minus one. You can do a u sub or you can guess and check. This is an easy derivative, antiderivative, so I'm not gonna do it. Next one over, one over x minus one squared. That is not one of those funky x squared minus one square root, that's not like that. Nor is it, it's not the tangent inverse. What's the easiest tool to use? U sub, what's good U sub? X. X, never good U sub. <laughs> X minus one, there we go. And then this will be one over U squared. So that's super easy. What about the first one? That one is less easy. So I will show you how to do the other ones. I expect you to be able to do the other two integrals, no problem. All right, how did I split up the integral? I split up over the numerator of the fraction. The easy way to break a fraction apart, not the painful way to do it. So this is the easy way to break it apart. Antiderivative one over x squared plus one. Tangent inverse, obviously. Right, that's on your formula sheet somewhere. It better be, or you have a bad formula sheet. Two x over x squared plus one not tangent inverse. How do you solve the first one? Yes. Well, and what is du? Oh yeah. <laughs> All right, so that's a u sub, and then this is tangent inverse that you didn't forget about, hopefully. There should be, I don't know, nine inverse trig slash hyperbolic trig antiderivatives. They should all be grouped together somewhere. So pay attention to those. This is going to be tangent inverse right there.